Well, uh, happy Valentine's Day to all of you guys. Um, it, uh, Valentine's Day tends to be kind of like Singles Awareness Day, too. Yeah, sad. Uh, yeah, sad. Uh, super sad, Singles Awareness Day. But tonight, um, you know, as I was preparing for the message um, for this week, really wasn't planning to do kind of a Valentine's or whatever thing, um, but as I got into the message, God just began to direct it towards, um, you know, really this, this whole theme of love and singleness and, and uh, all those kinds of things. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight, um, and it is going to be uh, a great time. So first question I have, I want to hear from you guys, is um, what are some things uh, that you realistically cannot do to honor God when you're single? Okay. What are some things that you realistically, you cannot do as a single person to honor God? Keith? Be fruitful and multiply. Ah, yeah. <laughs> That's good. Be fruitful. Oh, okay. Unless you're like... a way of putting sex. Uh, uh, so unless you like grow fruit trees of some sort and are really good at math. And like math. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> beat you to it. On top of that, what about the whole book of Song of Solomon? Uh, you, you, what, like you can't perform the book of Song of Solomon? <laughs> like as a, a dramatic play or something? <laughs> I probably should never use that phrase again. Perform the book of Song of Solomon. <laughs> hey, you should never say that again. I'm going to put that in the things I should never say again category. Okay, so fruitful and multiply. So you, you can't have sex and honor God as a single person. It's true. It's very true. Okay, uh, what else can you realistically as a single person not do to glorify God? Tim? Be a husband or a wife. Okay, so you can't be a husband or wife. And that is something that uh, glorifies God. So, so you can't be a husband or a wife. Okay. Depending on gender, you may not be able to do one even winner. <laughs> if you're a hermaphrodite. If you're a man, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, so if you're a man, you can't be a wife. Okay, right. I got it. I was yeah. just confused for a second. I was like, hermaphrodite, I don't know. Sorry. Aaron. Um, I guess if you're a guy, you can't love your wife as Christ loved the church. And if you're a girl, you can't submit to your husband. Right. So yeah. that's kind of along the same so, so, So you can't really honor God and, and glorify God in the way that marriage does honor and glorify God because you're not married. So, good. Jared? You probably shouldn't be leading, like, a marriage study. If yeah, married. yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, I, I even said, this is something I've come into actual contact with as a, as a single pastor, is it doesn't make sense to do marriage counseling. Right. Um, I did a, I performed a wedding, uh, like, two, two months ago, and did actually have to step into some counseling moments with them, which was awesome and different all at the same time. But it wouldn't make a lot of sense for me to do premarital counseling with somebody because, yeah, I have the Bible and I can say, yeah, love your wife like Christ, you know, be nice to each other, don't, you know, don't hate each other, don't sin against, you know, all those kinds of things. But there are certain things that you just have to be married in order to counsel someone who is married about their marriage. Um, so, so that's really good. So you can't, can't, uh, can't counsel, let's say, or lead Bible study for many people. That's good. What else? Be an elder in the church. Mm, that's debatable. Or one of the, one of the Depends on the church. Depends on the church. You can't be an elder in some churches if you are unmarried. Because uh, the qualification of an elder is that you should be the husband of but one wife. That can also be translated from the Greek, a one-woman man. Um, so there's, it's debatable whether or not single people can be an elder. If it's true that you can't be an elder unless you're married, that means Paul wouldn't have been able to be elder qualified, which is a little odd since he was an apostle to the whole church and in charge of setting elders in place. So that would be a little weird. But um, that's a little bit of my opinion bleeding into it <laughs> as a single man. So, um, and I'm not an elder at Mosaic. I am a pastor here, but not an elder. Uh, but that's not why I'm not an elder. I've got other disqualifying factors. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so, so, because I keep trying to perform Song of Solomon, and they're like, this is a problem. <laughs> 
I've never tried to do that. Okay, so, uh, all right, can't be an elder in the church. What else? Raising children, your own children, the way they should go. Ha. Can't raise <laughs> own. Because you could technically raise children. I mean, nanny, babysitting, something like that. You can also mentor uh, kids. Um, you can work in student ministry or children's ministry, uh, which is a partnership with, uh, with parents. Um, you can do mentoring for people who don't have parents. So you can do parenting, but you really can't parent unless you're like, what's that one book that's out? This lady, she adopted like eight kids, and she, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. Um, like a bunch of girls in my youth group are reading it. It's a missions uh, book. Is it the girl in Africa, Katie Davis? Yeah. I don't know the book, but I know that. Yeah, so this, there's this girl who's a missionary in Africa. She's adopted like eight African kids and then has like a passel of other kids that kind of cling to her everywhere. What did you say, eight or eight? Um, eight. Oh. So, um, Renault and Brooke are insane. They have eight kids. This girl did it by herself. So, so from an from an adoption standpoint, it's actually possible to adopt as a single person. Probably not ideal. I would say that that would be an extreme circumstance. Mm -hmm. Something if God really calls you to it mm -hmm. as a single person, you could potentially do it. I, I would suppose a loving single parent would be better than orphanage for a child. Um, although the the tough thing is, is you would need to bring. Um, either a father or a mother figure along to help um, a child see the full image of God, which can't be uh, can't be fully displayed in a home without father and mother, because that's how God created it. So, Tim, will you display the image of God in a home? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ah, Thank you. <laughs> yes. Jesus Your listening skills are on par. Yeah. Fully fully display Imago Dei, which does run. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, what else? It's a pretty good list. It's a good list. So we would agree there are some things that a single person can't do. Right? I mean, there are some things that we as single people, if we're single in this place, just cannot do um, to glorify God. That's just part of the place in life. Uh, that we're in. But tonight, what I'd like to talk about um, is what, what does it mean to use our singleness right now for the glory of God? What does that mean? Um, I think uh, a lot of times when, uh, you know, when you are, uh, when you're young, you kind of look at your place in life and think, man, you know, one day over the rainbow, I'll do these great things. Uh, but so often, especially in our lives as single people, we don't feel adequate. Uh, let's go back to our verse for the Unlikely series, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. And uh, someone, if you guys will turn there, uh, someone can yell out the page number because I don't know what it is. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. That way I'll be able to find it. <laughs> Wouldn't that be really funny if I didn't know that that was the Bible? I'm not sure where Haggai is. But. All right. So, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful, and not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring uh, to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Um, you know, I think that this, the point of this scripture in, in its essence, is that, um, you know, God doesn't need us to fit the mold to use us. God doesn't need us to be the thing that the world values, whatever that is, to use us. And you know what? This is huge, very important to grab a hold of this. God doesn't even need the things that the church sometimes overvalues in order to use us. How many of you guys have ever been approached by a well-meaning married person and asked something to this effect? Wow, you're so wonderful or sweet or pretty or good-looking or awesome. How is it possible that you're still single? Mm. Anybody been asked that question before? Every day. On the reg. 
course, people ask you that every day. Then they spend some time with you and realize. Um, uh, no, that's not true. Kale's, Kale's awesome. He is a catch, ladies. Um, so, you know, it, it really is, it, it is one of those things that even in the church, we over, like, we have an unhealthy value of marriage in the church. And in the world, we have a non-existent value of marriage, right? So you're kind of like, damned if you do, damned if you don't. If you're in the world, you know, what you're expected to do is have someone, but with no legitimate commitment, right? So you, so you need to have a relationship. If you don't have a relationship, um, or you're not shacking up with somebody, then you're broken in some way, or you're unlovely in some way. And in the church, if you're not married, oh man, there's a problem, especially when you get old like me, right? So like, the older that you get, the, the more that that is uh, highlighted in the church. And in the world, it's kind of like you need to have somebody. So the world thinks we're crazy because we're not, uh, you know, with somebody cohabitating or in, in sexual relationships. And then the church thinks we're crazy because we're not getting married. And I would say that it's a valuable thing, men, to pursue marriage. It's great. Get a job. Get an education. You know, stop playing video games and go get married. That's a valuable thing, right? Women, I think it's a valuable thing to desire to be married. It's different for you because you have to be pursued. It's odd and weird and actually not God's design for you to be the pursuers. And so you have to wait. And sometimes, especially in the church, it's very difficult because you're looking around and you're like, uh, there's no guys. You know? <laughs> and often, you're right. So the truth is, we find ourselves in a very difficult situation. And here is what so often we fall into the trap of doing. We just sit around and we wait until that one day off in the future when we meet that person, like many me, who will complete me, right? <laughs> complete me, you know? And then, and then we think that once we are now completed by another person, we can live now. Now we can live our lives for God, right? Um, I don't know uh, about you guys, but I remember, um, you know, kind of uh, when I was a kid thinking like, man, you know, when I uh, graduate high school, that's when I'm really going to serve God. Like for now, I'm going to kind of just, I'm going to play a lot of golf. I actually, my sister called me and I was like, hey, um, she actually, in, her husband interviewed for a job at Team Mania. And I get a phone call like that, that next week. And she's like, hey, um, my, uh, Jeff, my husband and I would like to send you on a mission trip this summer and we'll pay for the whole thing, anywhere you wanna go. I should have been like, yeah, Australia, throw me a trip on the Barbie, right? Like, I should have done something like that, gone on, on one of those mission trips and acted like I loved God, which I really didn't at the time. But, you know, I thought to myself, you know, I'll get to that some other time. Like, I'll serve God later on in my life. Um, you know, a lot of times we think, you know, when I, when I get a, the job that I want, when I get the career that I'm looking for, want, you know, once I finish with, with everything that, that it takes, I'll get this career. Or even when I finish, uh, you know, college, or when I leave home, when I leave my mom and dad's house, when I leave home, then I'm gonna really, really begin to serve God. Or, um, you know, whatever that, that kind of end point is in our mind, we're all kind of different in that, like, when I fill in the blank, I will serve God. Um, but you know, a lot of times, um, you know, that's the lie that we buy into. And it's a paralyzing lie because you know what the truth is? There's always that when I, I will. There's always that blank. You know, when you're, when you're uh, six years old, it's when I'm, uh, you know, when I'm finally in elementary school. When you're in elementary school, it's when I'm in middle school. When you're in middle school, it's when I'm in high school. When you're in high school, it's when I'm in college. When you're in college, it's like, man, college is hard. I gotta finish college. When you finish college, I gotta get a job. I gotta, gotta get a career. When you get your job and career, I gotta get a family. I gotta get a, a husband or a wife. When you get a husband or a wife, you think, man, you know, we gotta have kids soon. Or we're going to be too old when we have kids. And then when you have kids, it's like, oh my gosh, now i got to wait 18 years until they're out of the house. And then you have another kid, and you're like, crap, another 18 years. And then you have another kid, and you're like, darn it. And then, you know, you might do really something great for God and adopt, which is something great for God. And then, you know, so, so that's kind of the mentality that we have. When, 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 when. And then when our kids get out of the house, we've developed such a pattern in our lives of, 
when this happens, I will do this, that when our kids get out of the house, we're like, now what do I do? Right? We see this all the time with empty nesters. A midlife crisis comes on. They divorce their husband or wife. Because all they've been doing for this time, they've not been serving God, and they've been saying, I'll, I'll do something for God when my kids get out of the house. Right now, I just need to hunker down and survive. And then when the kids get out of the house, they don't know who they are. They don't have a mission. And things derail. And it's, uh, okay, well, well, the kids are out of the house, but we need to finish working so that we can retire and be financially secure. But then when you retire, it's like, man, I really enjoy my as John Piper said at the Passion <coughs> my seashell collection, you know? He talks about these two old couples, uh, I mean, this old couple that lives in South Florida, and they've been saying all their lives that they would serve God, and, and then at the end of their life, at the end of their retirement, all they've got is a shell collection. They get to heaven, and they see Jesus, and it's like, hey, God, here's my shell collection. And here we sit, right? We're at a point in our life that there's so much in front of us. And there's a good amount behind us, but there's so much in front of us. And the lie that we so often buy into is that, um, you know, I'm not blank enough to do something for God. Or I will do something uh, for God when I blank. But here we are, young adults. And the odd thing about it is that as young adults... Uh, we are the most mobile and usable generation that God has at his disposal. Because the truth is, even though when you get married, you, you know, have kids, and you, know, you, you, you go through that life, you should be serving God all the way through. And you can be serving God all the way through. Here's the truth. Is that as a single person, the ability that we have to serve God is actually greater than as a married person. Really? Is that really true? Yes, it is. Actually, the Bible tells me so. <laughs> you guys to, uh, to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul, uh, the, the Corinthian church was pretty jacked up. And Paul was writing to them because they had all kinds of things uh, wrong. And they got relationships way wrong. They got marriage wrong. They got singleness wrong. They kind of got it a lot wrong. And Paul is writing to them, and he's saying in verse 32, he picks up his thought and he says, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord. How to please the Lord. The married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the thing, things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit. Not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. <clears throat> wow. So as a single person, because we're not focused on, you know, as men, providing for, pleasing our wives, and as women, submitting to, pleasing our husbands, we're not. We're not focused in on that as single people. We can have not, see, a lot of times we think of singleness as I'm without another. Right? We think of that. I mean, that's kind of actually what the term implies. You are single. You are by yourself. But one thing that God convicted me of a long time ago when I first ran into this verse is, Joel, I don't want you just to be single. I want you to be single-mindedly devoted to me. 
See, that's the gift of singleness that Paul talks about. We think about singleness, and it's like, I don't really want the curse of singleness. I mean, gift of singleness, you know? <laughs> but the gift of singleness is this. You don't have to worry about another person. Wow, that's awesome. That's great. Now, you should worry about yourself. You shouldn't let mommy and daddy worry about you. Men, especially. <laughs> worry about yourself. But have single-minded devotion to God, knowing that you can change the world. I meant to bring it. Forgot it. Um, my passport I got 10 years ago. It's about to expire. And I got my passport when I was a part of a program that Melanie talked about. Uh, it's called the Honor Academy. And it's a one year long program that's meant to be for people who finish high school, who graduate high school, and want to consecrate or set apart a year of their life to devote single mindedly their, their lives to God. That for that year, being married, having a girlfriend, a boyfriend is not even on the table but that you are single-mindedly devoted to God for one year of your life. It was an amazing year, an incredible year. And that year, I went on my first mission trip. Even though I could have gone on a free mission trip a couple years before, and I said no, um, I went to Panama. So I went and applied for a passport, and I didn't know what my future would hold in terms of where I would go and what I would do for God. But I get to Panama, and... It was the craziest thing. When I shared the gospel with people, it was like they were excited to hear that Jesus loved them. What? <laughs> you know, we're used to the United States where it's like, I don't want to bring up Jesus, but they might not like me. You know? It's scary to share your faith in America sometimes, isn't it? I mean, it's like, Ugh. But in Latin America, you go there and they're like, I want to hear more about Jesus. And the thing that happened to me on that mission trip, I don't know, I, 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 don't, I can't imagine myself ever being the same as before this trip. But I became absolutely addicted to taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to the nations. I went on that mission trip and I was like, I, I gotta do this again. I didn't speak any Spanish on that trip. Before that trip, I knew two phrases. Please stand clear of the doors. Por favor, manténgase alejado de las puertas. Okay, that was one. And the other one was, tengo un gato en mi pantalón. Which means I have a cat in my pants. I don't really know what that means. That sounds violent and like bad scratches. But, um, but I didn't know any Spanish. Um, my, my Spanish teacher in high school, every morning we'd walk in, and I would, I would walk in every morning. My name in Spanish was Jorafredo, which is Jeff. <laughs> that just thought it sounded funny. And I would walk in every day to the door, through the doors, and go, Please stand clear of the doors. Por favor, manténgase alejado de las puertas. I would walk to my desk, put my head down, and I was out like a light until the bell rang. Hated Spanish. I went to uh, Panama on that first mission trip. And every time I shared the gospel, I had to have an interpreter with me. And it bugged me. I thought, man, I have got to learn Spanish because I know God's going to send me back to a nation that speaks Spanish. And the next time I go, I want to be able to share with them the gospel without someone else helping me. So I came back and I had a friend, Gabe Forsyth. He's our missions director here. Gabe is bilingual. Uh, he grew up as a missionary kid in Guatemala, so he's fluent in Spanish and English. And so Gabe and I uh, would practice together. We would practice Spanish together. And we had great conversations, um, like, donde esta el baño? Me gusta la biblioteca. You know, like, like, it was pretty basic at first. But as I learned, it got to the point where I was more and more and more comfortable. So when I went to Spain the next summer, I wasn't quite able to preach the gospel full-blown in Spanish. But I was able to develop a bridge of friendship as these Spaniards who speak perfect Spanish laughed at me as I was butchering their language, right? <laughs> and as I was butchering their language, they realized, you know what? This American actually gives a crap. And Spain is not Latin America. Spain is Europe. Spain is Europe, which is post-Christian. 
Spain is actually uh, less than 4% Christian, which the United States is a much more Christian nation than Spain. We wouldn't think of it that way because we think of Catholicism and all of that. Well, think about the Spanish Inquisition and the, the black mark that is on their history with Christianity. And so they're very averted to the gospel. But I had the opportunity to share the gospel with people and see people come to Christ. That was the second mission trip I went on. Subsequently, I went on a trip to India, then a trip to Uzbekistan, then a trip to, oh gosh, where was next? Uh, then a trip to Haiti, uh, then a trip to Mexico, then a trip to the Dominican Republic, and there's more in between. And I have a full passport now of stamps and marks on my history of times where most of those stamps are made because I was on a mission to share the gospel with people. And that's not to say, oh, look at me. That's to say this. If I had gotten married at age 20, there's not a chance that my passport would have those stamps. Maybe a couple, but it wouldn't have so many. You guys, because God has allowed me to be single for 10 years as an adult, I've been able to use my life in a way that glorifies God differently than I would have had I been married. It's not better. It's different. But it's a gift. It's beautiful. It's a great thing. It's an incredible thing. And I think so often we shortchange what God wants to do in our lives, what he wants to use us to do, because we sit and pine away for the day that we'll have someone by our side. You know, when the disciples spent three years with Jesus, as Jesus was saying, I'm going to go, it was a scary thing for them. But Jesus promised that he would send somebody who was even better than he was on this planet to be with them. The Holy Spirit. He's our comforter, he's our counselor, and he's our guide. And he empowers us to be witnesses for the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you're single, you're not alone. If you've got your faith put in Jesus for your salvation, you have the Holy Spirit living in you. And he wants to empower you. He wants to accompany you. In fact, he wants you to accompany him on his mission to reach the world with the gospel. We're not alone as single people. This is Singles Awareness Day. Let's change it around a little bit in our mind and allow it to be Single Mindedness Day. A day where we can remember that we have the awesome privilege to be single minded in our devotion to the Lord. That's awesome. That's worth it. It's worth it. So, you know, as. Um, as we think about, you know, this idea of, of unlikely, you know, we as single people from the world's perspective are unlikely candidates to do something great on this planet. From the perspective of the world, we're just weird and broken because we don't have some relationship that we're getting something from. In the church, we're a little bit broken as well, often because married people forget what it's like to be single. And they don't really always understand the valuable gift that being single is. But this stage of life is the stage that God says we are the most able and the most likely, actually, to do something great for him, which is an amazing thing. So I want to share with you guys four ways, four ways that God can use your singleness to change the world. You guys ready for this? No? Yeah. All right, four ways. And uh, this might be wise to write down. Grab your phone, put your notepad on, write it down. Unless you want to be a hearer of the word and not a doer and walk away and forget what you look like. Ooh, that's not wise. Yeah, it sounds wise. Great. First way that we can
can change the world as young adults. We can go. We're so mobile. I got a phone call one time. No, actually, it wasn't a phone call. I got an invitation. I was sitting at, at, at a dessert with uh, Brady's dad. And Brady's dad was uh, leading a mission trip like two weeks from that day and invited me to go. I was on that plane. I didn't have to ask anybody. I said, okay, I have the money. I'll go. Go! Find somewhere to go. Go to your college campus. Go to your workplace. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus gives the Great Commission. And when he gives it to us, he says, Going therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you, and I will be with you always, even to the very end of the age. Going therefore, that word go, it's not a from point A to point B. B. It's not stop, go. It's going. It's a transitive verb. In your going, make disciples of the nations. Share with them what it means to, to obey the teachings of Jesus. In your going, make disciples. Now, sometimes that means you've got to get up from where you are and go somewhere, right? It will help the process of you making disciples of the nations in your going. Sometimes going on a mission trip will teach you how to make disciples in your going. It's one, one thing I love about short-term missions. But go. It's actually not a question. Jesus doesn't say, go and make disciples of all nations. It's a command. It's not the great question. It's not the great proposition. It's not the great idea. It is the great co-mission, a mission we get to be on with the Holy Spirit, we can go. We are the most mobile generation on planet Earth. We're no longer under mom and dad's uh, you know, authority in terms of, well, it's debatable. It depends on where you're at in life. But you're, you're an adult, so you can go. You actually don't have to ask permission from mom or dad to sign up for a mission trip. Legally, you can do that, right? You don't have to ask mom and dad for permission to go down to Church Street on a Friday night and share the gospel. You don't have to ask for mom and dad's position, uh, permission to do really anything unless you live in their home. That changes things, okay? But we are a mobile generation. We are both able to go and we have the least baggage to worry about. Because we don't have families. We don't have, you know, we haven't been fruitful and multiplied, hopefully. <laughs> right? If you have a baby mom, it might change things. You might not be able to go because you've got a, a check to pay every month. That's why doing things God's way leads to freedom. Okay. <laughs> go! Evangelize and disciple. That's what it means to go. It means to evangelize and disciple. How do you make disciples of the nations? Well, first you have to teach them who Jesus is, and then teach him to obey his commands. So go and make disciples. You can do that here. You can do that all over the world. But you are the most mobile generation. Second way. Send. Send people. There are people who are going that are worth sending. Whether it's short term or it's long term. If someone's going... Help them go. Use your money. Oh, but I don't have much money. Who cares how much you have? Use what you have for the glory of God. If you don't tithe, what is wrong with you? I can say that because I'm not Renault. You know? I'm not going to, you know, be real nice and gentle about it. We're young adults. We can be real in this place. Give your money to God. It's actually his anyway. If you're not tithing, here's what that says. God, not all of what I have is yours. Oh, but I can't afford to tithe. Yeah, you actually can. Every human can afford to give. If you can't, it's because there's another issue involved. Whether it's that you're not working, which is an issue. Um, whether it's you are in debt, which is an issue. There's another issue involved. But every Christian can give. Just like every Christian should have a passport, in my opinion, so that you can go. Okay? You should give your money.
to God. We don't take up an offering here at Converge. We don't take up an offering on Sunday mornings. We have offering boxes in the back. I don't care if you give to Mosaic. If Mosaic's not your home church, you actually should not give to Mosaic. You should give to your home church. Some of you guys are part of another church. Give to that church. Because ultimately, you're giving to God. I don't care where it goes. We don't actually need your money. God, in fact, doesn't actually need your money. But you need for your money not to rule over you. So the reason why Jesus commanded us to give is because you can't serve both God and money. So if you're keeping all of your money, you think it's yours, and it controls you, you don't control it. So give. Find ways to give. Find ways to make a difference in the world. Find causes. Find things that matter to you. Give 10% first, like automatically. Like 10% should come automatically out of your paycheck. We live in a wonderful world with technology. You get paid, make it happen. Make it happen. First of all, give 10%. And then, man, find ways to be generous. Do it to your unsaved waiter when you go out to eat. If you can afford to go out to eat, you can afford to tip well. You better do it, especially if they know you're a Christian. If there's even a suspicion that you might be a Christian, you better tip well. Be generous. Give. And then when you come across stories, when you know someone is going and making disciples, man, send them. Send them. Whether it's a short-term trip or they're a long-term missionary, man, do something. Send them. <clears throat> Send your money to the nation so that the gospel would be able to be preached. Oh my gosh, there's people that need to hear the gospel. Give your money to that. Man, Starbucks coffee is great, but the gospel is better. Do I drink Starbucks? Yes. <laughs> like, I'm not saying it's... You, you guys get my heart, I hope. If you don't, come, come ask me afterwards and I'll preach at you more. Okay. <laughs> Third way. The biggest thing that bothers me about this is when we think we don't have enough money to make a difference. It, uh, I'm going to camp out here. The passion, <laughs> the passion Conference in Atlanta. Here's what's <coughs> both awesome and ultra makes me want to vomit all over myself all at the same time. Right? Passion Conference takes up an offering and people step up to the plate and they raise millions of dollars in pledges. How do you guys think those young adults follow through on those pledges? Be responsible with your money so you can give. And don't listen to the lie that just because I only make X amount of dollars that I can't be generous. Listen, if you have a roof over your head, you eat three meals a day, I forget sometimes breakfast, but if you can afford to eat three meals a day, and you have spare change in your car? So, check. Check, check. Some of you are like, coins are weird. Um, <laughs> Amanda Wright, she doesn't have any spare change in her car. Um, so you, if, if that's you if, you, if all those things are check, check, check for you, do you know that you're in the top, I don't know, 5% or whatever, wealthy in the entire world? It's mind-blowing. Listen, if you don't understand that you're wealthy, it's probably because you've never been on missions. Figure out a way to get on missions so you know how freaking wealthy you are. And then, when you recognize how wealthy you are, send people to bring the gospel to the nations. Oh, okay? Okay. The third thing you can do is mobilize. Mobilize. What does that mean? Help other people recognize what we are recognizing together tonight. See, Converge is actually not about me, you know, spitting out lots of words for 45 minutes. Although, I enjoy it. <laughs> I hope you do too. Converge is not about that. It's actually about the, I don't know, 15 or whatever of us that are here tonight, or the 20 or 30 or whatever that say, yeah, I go to Converge. 
It's about us having our hearts and lives changed so that we can actually have legitimate conversations with people that we know who love Jesus, and we can talk to them about the things that we're talking about here. So one of the reasons that we make this as interactive as possible, we ask you guys questions, have you talk amongst yourselves, and we give you topics, chickpeas, have the chicks not please discuss. Um, it's one of the reasons that we want this to be a conversational reality, because we want to learn how to have conversations with other people about things that matter. Like, this should matter to us. You know what I'm saying? So when you, I don't know, are at Oxum and you're having conversations with Christians in the community because they flock to Oxum, <laughs> they think it's a Christian coffee shop, but it's not. It's just a social justice coffee shop. <laughs> We're not a Christian coffee shop. And it's not Mosaic. Okay. Um, so when you're there and you run into someone from, I don't know, a great church in the area, the Crossings Church, or you run into someone from real life or you're in Run to someone from another church. Man, strike up a conversation. Hopefully, you can have conversations about this type of stuff. Now, you know, maybe that's natural. Maybe it's not. If it's not, don't do it. Let it be natural. Don't be weird. You know, you're talking about, like, the Mets and the Braves game because it's the World Series, and then you're all of a sudden like, have I talked to you about going to the nations? <laughs> you're weird. No. And I actually, the conversation's over. So see you later, and enjoy the cup of coffee. You might want to switch to decaf. So let it be natural, but talk to people about taking the gospel to the nations. Talk to people about sex trafficking. Talk to people about, listen, Coney 2012 should be a great example to us. Some high school kids, some college kids, heard about Coney 2012 and used Facebook. What? Facebook to mobilize, which means help people get moving, into action and shut down Coney's operation. Like, for real, that happened. Social media was used by middle schoolers and high schoolers and college students to stop someone committing violent acts in Africa and creating child slavery. Wow. <laughs> you know, we have more of a voice than any generation has ever had. You know, back when I was a kid, no one had middle school, high school, college students didn't have a national voice. You know, I can post something on Facebook, and people who I know in Texas, or Washington, or South Africa can see, Dominican Republic, all over, can see what I've posted, and they can repost it, and it can spread like wildfire. What? That was never possible 50 years ago, 30 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago. Five, you know, five years ago, it's, it started to emerge. Wow. You can mobilize people into action. You find something you're passionate about, man, to write love on our arms. This is a, a, a movement that was mobilized by a band who started to wear these t-shirts. Then another band. Then a couple other bands. Then some fans. And this, this movement began. Yeah, status. Now the City Beautiful Church, status, a young adult ministry. They helped a girl get free from drug addiction. She had been cutting all kinds of stuff. She wrote uh, a cuss word on her arm because that is what she identified mostly with, that, that she was worthless. And these people helped her with the gospel and loved her through her pain. And then they started a movement which gave awareness to this problem that tons and tons of young women and young men deal with all over the nation. And it's actually helping people. See, we can mobilize people to do lots and lots of things. Think about it. We mobilize people. What's your favorite TV show right now? Shout it out. Duck Dynasty. Duck Dynasty. I love it. I love it. Listen, I was preparing um, to give. We, we did a Q&A session last night in student ministry. And it was about, we're doing a series called Love and Stuff. So we're talking about sex and all kinds of stuff. And, you know, I mean, like, for real. Like, they ask questions like, what about oral sex and masturbation and all this stuff? And we're having, like, legit conversations with them about it. And I'm watching Duck Dynasty, and I hear the grandpa 
explain the birds and the bees to his grandson by using crawfish. It was awesome. It was like, see that? That's a little crawfish, you know. <laughs> he's like, he's explaining the birds and the bees with a crawfish. How awesome is that, right? Duck Dynasty, great show. What other shows are awesome? Suits. Suits. Haven't seen it. Maybe I'll check it out. What else? Arrested Development. Arrested Development. Man, Arrested Development was a show that got canceled. And then when it got rediscovered through Netflix, it spread like wildfire. It was a show that was kind of before its time. It's pretty crass, disclaimer. Um, I will neither admit nor deny whether I've seen it. I just know about it. Um, but Arrested Development is, is a, a show that was literally popular, uh, made popular after it was canceled by people who mobilized other people to begin to watch it. Duck Dynasty. I heard about Duck Dynasty over and over again. I was like, man, what in the world is Duck Dynasty? And then someone explained it to me. It's about these rich, rich hillbilly people. You, it's hilarious. You've got to check it out. I'm like, really? So I looked at it. I was like, this is the funniest thing I've ever seen. And it's clean, and they love God. I mean, it's so cool, right? We know how to mobilize, but are we passionate about anything that matters? Please. Use what's at your fingertips, which is more time than you could ever imagine. Oh, but I'm really busy. You have no concept of busy. Renault, he's busy. That guy's got eight kids. He leads a church of thousands of people. And that guy is using his life for the kingdom still. You know, it only gets busier, right? You're not too busy. You have time. You have so much time. You have a voice. Use it, right? Okay, so we can mobilize people into action when we get passionate about something, whether that is a cause or a specific mission or um, the mission that Jesus put us on, taking the gospel to the nations. So, and then the last um, and probably perhaps the most important Intercede. Pray. Dude, pray. Men, hey, pray. Pray to God. The, the prayer of a righteous man avails much. You know, there's a lot of women who are powerful prayer warriors, very few men. Why? What are we busy doing? Pray. War. In the spirit, for God to move on this planet. And pray for the nations, and God can change the world. And pray for your friends who don't know Jesus, and God can turn their dead heart and make it alive. Pray. If we don't pray, we're acting like idiots. Not joining in the running of the universe with the God of the universe is foolish because he's invited us to. It's crazy, but it's true. Let's pray. Let's pray that God would reach Muslims. You know the number one way that Muslims are coming to Christ? Is that Jesus himself is coming to them in visions, saying, I'm Isa, it's the Arabic name for Jesus, I'm Isa, and I'm the way, come and follow me. People are having visions about God. Let's pray for that to happen. God, there's a Muslim somewhere in the world that you desperately want to reach. We pray that you would reach them tonight on Valentine's Day. That your love would be extended to that Muslim and they would see that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That his whole family would become a Christian. That a generation would be changed. And guys, we have the power to shape the world through prayer. God's in control. And he's asked us to join him in the running of the universe. 
and we have the most time and energy. The young adult decade of life, or whatever it is, is this incredible convergence. You're welcome. <laughs> of you're not a kid anymore. You're able to, to, to look at this Bible, and if you actually open it, study it, and dig into it, you can know what it says and follow it. You have no ties to anything. This is a great time of life. Man, God can use us to change the world. So just four ways that we can engage in what God is doing on this planet. And every one of these four, except perhaps this, but here's the thing. We may not make as much money as we'll make when we're 60, but I will tell you this. You probably have more expendable income at this time of your life than you ever will. What's expendable income? Money you can waste. Because when you do get a wife, you get a husband, you get other bills that come with that. Lots of other bills. You get a house, lots of bills. Trust me, I know right now. A lot of bills. You get kids. Oh boy. Diapers? Have you ever looked into the diaper aisle? That's good birth control right there. <laughs> That'll help you not try to do this one before it's time. <laughs> you just go look at the price of diapers like, oh yeah, I don't even want to have sex. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Like a virgin. I love it. Right? But we have more expendable income right now at this stage of our life than we ever will. You might make more money in the future. Maybe. You won't have more money in the future. Most definitely, right? Use what you have now. You may die tomorrow. Use what you have now. Don't wait till later. So, man, there's so much more. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, there's a... Uh, There's a group of people that lived 100, or uh, hundreds of years ago, not 100 years ago. They lived hundreds of years ago, and um, many church uh, denominations, and kind of many church movements have sprung out of this movement. Uh, many people groups have come to Christ because this movement happened. Keith, we do, do we have this video? You're amazing. Okay. Um, they're called the Moravians. And um, we're about to hear their story. And the Moravian people were very interesting people. They were the kind of people that were so convinced that God could use them. That whatever they felt like God called them to, they went and did it. They didn't care what it took. If they needed to be married to do it, and they were single, here's how the Moravians would handle it. Someone would walk up and say, yeah, I really feel called to go to this people group. Um, and they would say, well, you know, you really should be married to go to that people group because they value marriage very highly in that particular culture. So if you don't go uh, as a married person, you, you can't reach that culture. So they would say, okay. And uh, they would find a, a spouse for that person. So if it was a woman, they would find a man and be like, hey, you two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you and you. Right? Do you know each other? Doesn't really matter. Uh, I now pronounce you husband and wife. You may get to know one another on the ship. <laughs> For real? <laughs> Sorry. That's both awesome and terrifying all at the same time, right? <laughs> like, you're like, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, please God, please God, you know? <laughs> oh my gosh, not that annoying kid, Joel. Oh my God. <laughs> so, that's the way they handled missions. They're like, if God calls us to do it, let's do whatever it takes. We're going to hear a very extraordinary story about some Moravian people and the call of God on their life. And what they did to, to serve God. So um, it's uh, the story's told by a worship leader and kind of got a song that's written with it. Um, but let's take a look at this video and and then I'll share a few things with us. Okay. It was the early 1700s 
when John Leonard Dobear and David Nitchman first heard about the island. They were at church on an ordinary Sunday morning and the pastor was speaking about a place in the West Indies where there had never been any gospel witness. He told of a man who lived on an island who was an atheist slave owner with about 3,000 slaves, all of whom would live and die there without a chance to ever hear of Jesus. Deeply disturbed by what they heard, these two men in their early 20s made the decision to go to this place to reach these slaves with the gospel. Their plan, sell themselves into slavery so that they could be among these men. Sell themselves into slavery. It, these guys, they weren't heading on a short-term mission trip. These men left to go and live and suffer as slaves, and they had no idea if they would ever come back. Their families and friends, in large part, were all against their decision, and yet John and David prepared to go. And so the story goes, these two young men arrived at the pier to board the ship, their families and friends all there to say goodbye, and they were sure they would never see them again. The men boarded the ship and set out, and as the gap between the shore and the ship widened, the two men linked arms, and one of them raised his hand and shouted across the gap these final words. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering.
maybe a lamb that was slain win the reward of his suffering. Wow. Man, what, what a like life anthem that that is. Like, what a, a great cry of our heart. Like, may the lamb that was slain win and receive the reward of his suffering. So often, at this stage of our life, the cry of our heart is, God, when are you going to bring me my spouse? What a short change that is. So, on this Valentine's Day, February 14th, 2013, I hope that when someone asks you the question years from now, what was the best Valentine's Day you ever had? But this night, I would come to your memory. And you would be able to say, the day that I realized that being single was a gift and not a curse. And from that day forward, I used my singleness for the glory of God.